I'm going to talk a little bit about my kind of experience uh, as a creative director. I was a creative director for uh, many, many years. Uh, lastly, at a company called Product Madness um, for um, starting a different studio. So just a little bit about myself. Um, so my background is actually kind of computer science and fine arts. That's always what I kind of enjoy doing. So kind of games was super natural for me. Um, I got into, I guess, kind of leading our teams really, really early on. Um, I did it for the Israeli intelligence, which is... Uh, quite unusual. Uh, you can <laughs> chat to me about that later. It's quite interesting. And um, then I, I did a BA in game design and then um, kind of started off in consoles. And then eventually I, I kind of joined Product Madness really early on. They're one of the big sponsors here tonight. Um, and kind of started off there and kind of scaled to a credit department uh, that's now, I don't know, 20, 30 people. A few of them are here. So it's really nice to kind of see these guys. Um, a lot of these guys are now uh, kind of in the team, different like art directors running their own projects. And that's really, really cool to see. And recently, I co-founded a studio called Triple Dot uh, with uh, two other guys, Lior, who's standing over there, um, and another guy called Akin, who's uh, running around. So um, yeah, that's super interesting. So I think the first thing to kind of think about really when you talk about, I would say almost the trajectory of almost any kind of creative department is, you know, you kind of start off, you know, usually you're, you're a tiny team and you're kind of going everywhere. And that kind of grows, so you get to be a few more people and it's still chaos and you're still kind of working on a ton of game. But then eventually you start kind of honing in on the few successful products that you really like and that's kind of what the, I guess, the, the trajectory of, of most uh, kind of big creative departments are. Um, so I'm going to talk about like, I would say, uh, five kind of quick lessons that I've kind of picked up over the years and try to leave some time for QA. So my first lesson is just pick a couple of crocs and buy them already. So where does this come from? So I think if you're going to think of the beginning of a design process, you're looking at this or you're looking at this. There's this really beautiful moment where it's kind of blue ocean and everyone's trying really cool stuff and there's so much to do and you're not quite sure what's going on. And it's really, really easy to get stuck in this kind of indecision limbo for a long time, both creatively and also from a kind of game design point of view. Um, so the real problem with that is, even though it's really fun, is that the truth is you really don't have time to explore a lot of ideas. And even, I guess, more misleading is a lot of times when you're kind of throwing things on the whiteboard, really the simpler ideas kind of work right off the bat because they're simpler. So some of the more complicated ones, they just don't work. And that could kind of lead you to, like, missing really, really good opportunities because you just wanted to kind of find something that kind of, I don't know, kind of that felt better now and you didn't really get a chance to kind of explore and cook something fully. Um, and, of course, if, you know, anyone here has ever made a game before, you know that realistically what's... The way the game looks at the end of the process is nothing like it looks at the beginning of the process. And that gets really hard when you start to play catch up with, you know, the game design document or the tech stack and everything like that. So, so one of the things that I would really recommend as, as much as I can is really just as quick as possible, just get your team rowing in the right direction or in, in, in a single direction, which inevitably is the right direction. So you pick an idea and you just start running with it. As you start kind of working, developing this idea, you know, you commit to it and you say, this is what the game's going to look like, but I'm going to allow myself to course correct as I go. And I'm going to try different stuff. And you know what? Sometimes you have to kind of go backwards and kind of pivot in a different direction, but just start at it as quick as possible. Um, and I think this really comes down to something that I really believe in is that honestly, if you have, you know, done a game jam before or made a game, most games don't fail because whatever the game design document wasn't good enough or whatever they felt because you didn't have enough time. And really, the whole idea behind this is that I want to take those two months that I could have wasted doing experimentation, I want to get working right at the beginning, and I want to have those two months at the end to really fine-tune whatever I'm working on, because that's where you really need it. Um, so I think, you know, and, and this is coming down if you are, let's say, an art director or a creative director, or you're the guy kind of leading this decision. I think realistically, and this is kind of hard because you want to inspire creativity and you want everyone to be part of the process, but really you need to be able to kind of put your foot down and have the final say. And you know, this isn't because you're smarter or you're better, or you've done this before, it's because ultimately this is, you know, your responsibility. So you need to be kind of, you know, like you need to grow a pair, say this is what we're going to do and hope for the best. And uh, it's on you and that's okay. That's how it works. Lesson two, let's get technical. So this was a huge problem for, for kind of me at the beginning of, of working in, um, in Product Madness, right? Where really you had this creative department that could do really cool stuff and then somewhere along the line, they just stopped kind of contributing to the project and then the dev team kind of took over. And I think this is something that we've seen in many, many studios. It's, it's a really, really big problem, right? Is that a big problem? 
Uh, first of all, is you know kind of a creative department. We only get to own part of the process, which is really frustrating. Uh, the other part of it, which is you know just the sad truth, is that you know devs cost more than artists. It's just the way it always is. Meaning that if they're you know you're fighting on a dev time between implementing a really cool whatever particle system and fixing the uh, I don't know like a payment API, you're not going to get your particle system in there, and that's a shame, right? Um, you know, one thing developers hate is just to, everyone does, but hates to implement art. I mean, it's, it's arduous work and they, they don't, you know, might not have an eye for it and it gets really, really tricky. Um, you know, they do optimization and obviously when you have that handover, there's a lot of room there for, uh, for I guess, things to fall between the cracks. So really what I'm, what that kind of did is kind of did a, uh, it triggered this kind of mindset and um, this change, I guess, in the way we structured the creative team and we kind of went after two different things. Whatever, first of all, kind of technical creatives and creatives who are technical. Um, and this really means kind of a bunch of stuff. So even if you are an artist, just, you know, you're a classic 2D artist and we were kind of looking at and we're hiring and even, you know, for, for Triple Dot now, it's, it's exactly the same thing. If you come at me and you show me a really good sketchbook, I'm going to say, listen, that's a really nice sketchbook, but I want to know how you're going to get this into a game. How you're going to break it up? How you're going to use whatever engine that you want to use to kind of make it work? And I think getting those kind of artists is a big, big difference. And the flip side, there's also technical artists. So these are kind of programmers who are, I would say, almost. I mean, they have they have an eye for design and they can get it. But you know, at their heart, they're almost developers, and that's fantastic. And it's a great addition to any creative team. Um, so once you kind of have that in place, you start to fight for a pipeline within the organization that you can control. Um, and when I mean control, I mean, so we're going to do everything from designing it on paper to, you know, implementing it, to putting it into the build, to pushing it into Git, to testing it on device, to committing it. Um, and I think, you know, that's on the one hand, it makes the creative side much more powerful. But, you know, you have to also take on those responsibilities. It, like I remember when, again, when we did it, it was the first time that, you know, an artist could go in there and break, uh, you know, break a build for developers, which obviously caused a lot of tension at the beginning of the process. Um, but I think it's really important, and I think kind of having the artist take responsibility for what's happening is a huge, huge process, um, huge uh, pro, sorry. So, and I think really, when this comes down to kind of being strategic and not tactical, um, building an art team that's super technical, and when I say art team, really I'm also talking about, you know, it could be game designers, people who tweak the engine, it could be story writers, it could be anything like that. But Getting these people that are able to go into the game and really tweak something on an engine level takes a lot of time and a lot of training and it takes kind of building the right process and it, this could take a year to, to do. So I think you really need to be strategic in that and really be okay to kind of commit to that time. So I think here really what it comes down to is that um, what we say like a triple dot, uh, we try to make everyone an implementer. So I think one of the big things that we're trying to do is really make that anyone in the company could go in there and you know download the Unity um, kind of files and go in there and change everything and try it out and build it on their device and see how it feels. Um, if you are kind of stuck with the process where there's a handful of people that they're the only ones who can kind of implement any kind of idea, then you're going to have a real problem. All right. So this is kind of what, you know, it should look like kind of towards the end of it where really the creative work can control everything beginning to end. All right. So now let's talk about a little bit about money bowling. So this is kind of what you were saying before, right? So it's really, your end game really is to make, you know, a great game. It's not to make a great creative department or whatever, right? Um, so what does that mean? I think, so I think we all have this kind of idea that we want to we wanna build a team of rock stars. And, you know, that's great and that's, you know, super important. And I think there's a lot of uh, romanticism around that. Um, but realistically, when you kind of think of how a team needs to be constructed, you want a, you want a, you want a strong team. You, want, you don't want to necessarily strong individuals building a team. Um, and to that extent, I will, you know, and I'll say this, and you know, this might be, you know, you can disagree, and that's fine, but you know, strong people don't necessarily make strong teams. So requirements always change, which I think that's part of it. You know, you're bringing in a rock star. This guy might be a phenomenal, uh, whatever, uh, storyboard artist, and six months on the track, you don't need a storyboard artist anymore. So you kind of got a problem now. So you need to be able to be kind of adaptive in, in the team that you have. Um, hiring is always a gamble, which again, like, you know, you could, you could go as rigorous as you can, but ultimately until someone's sitting there in the office with you for four months, you have no idea. You know, if this person is nice or they're crazy or they're talented. So, you know, just kind of bear that in mind. And rising UA costs, which, you know, I think if anyone here works in actual UA, I think it is exactly the same thing when you're hiring. If you or a small studio and you want to get one or two artists, you know what, you'll find a great artist for a great cost and that's cool. 
when you're trying to hire your 30th artist, at this point, you're going to start paying a lot because you're starting to poach from other companies, you're starting to bring in people from overseas. So it is, it is really hard getting that really great talent. So, you know, sometimes you don't necessarily want to get that, that super rock star. So how do you go about it? Well, I would say the first thing you need to do is really think about the project. What do I need for the project? I need a, whatever, I need a writer, two animators, someone to do marketing art. I need uh, someone who can do a bit of characters. Start there, put your, put your preference together, and then think what kind of team would I need to build around this? And then really start looking at the actual people that are available to you. Uh, don't be scared to hire up or down, which means, you know, obviously, um, and, and this I would say to any kind of beginning, uh, any art director or creative director that's kind of starting out, I think there's this impulse to kind of not hire people that are much, much stronger than you. It's just like basic instincts. Uh, always hire like stronger than you if it is called for. But also, you know, like sometimes it's okay to hire someone. I mean, you know, you need someone for a specific role, get that specific role. Like even if there's there are many more stronger candidates available. If you just need someone who can sit in there and, I don't know, kind of do, uh, I have no idea, just do like a website kind of whatever, like template designs, that's what you need to get. You don't necessarily need to get someone who can go in there and start doing animations and tech art. Um, kind of, you know, think about what you're trying to grow. Are you trying to grow scale? Do you need more of the same? Do you need expertise? So do you need to bring in a specific talent in a specific way? I need someone who knows to do, you know, spine animation now. Or do I need capabilities? Is, is there something that, like, something that we don't have internally at all now? We want to bring someone who can like, raise the level of everyone around us. Um, you're hiring personalities, not skills. It's another kind of big thing. That's, I, I strongly believe in that. You know, you'll, you'll sit down, you'll interview people, you'll talk to them. You know, some people are, I don't know, some people are go-getters, some people are just happy doing their nine to five. That's all great, but like, that's really what you should be looking for more than anything else. Um, and when you kind of put all these things together, you're really just kind of growing the team in the right direction. All right. So this is like another thing that I kind of really believe in. A lot of people kind of really hold on to trying to hire the perfect candidates. Um, you know, I, I think that's great. But I think a lot of times just hiring someone now and spending six months training them is better than just having an open position for six months. Right. It's, uh, it's still a gamble. Everyone should be replaceable. Coming to everyone should be replaceable. I think that really the, the bottom line of that is that everyone uh, should really have a succession plan. There should be a contingency for anyone leaving the company, including yourself, by the way, right? And I think that's important. I think it forces people to define exactly what they ro their roles are. It forces people to uh, find kind of a second in command and start sharing some of that knowledge and mentoring that person. Um, it kind of makes your company slightly more, I guess, uh, churn-proof, which is really, really important. Um, and you know you want to kind of find the right people. It also means that you're finding the right people that are worthy of investment. So if you're working and you don't have someone that you feel can, maybe not now, maybe not in you know six months, but in a year down the track, kind of take on your responsibilities, you're probably not investing enough in your people, or you're probably not hiring strong enough. So I think that's something that everyone should have, like no matter what, no matter what role, no matter what department. If you do need to kind of break up, you know, break up quickly, break up amicably. Um, you know, there's no point kind of dragging any anything on. Uh, so again, succession plans for everyone, uh, invest in your people, um, and when you are looking for a kind of a successor or someone to invest in, really you're not looking for another version of yourself, really sit down and figure out what are the key things that you really bring to the table that are really important for you in this company, that's the person you need to be hiring, right? So, you know, you're not looking for you 2.0. Okay, so I think really just to kind of move forward in this one really, I think the, the idea behind this is that every person has their own journey, and I think what really happens, and happens in a lot of kind of creative departments, is that a lot of times people kind of start moving up the pyramid and roles get fewer and fewer and fewer. Um, and I think that's a problem because I think ultimately the you know, final end game of every whatever artist or designer shouldn't be whatever, uh, art director or creative director or something like this. They are, there are amazing roles in between. There are amazing roles that we need amazing people for. So you need strong artists, you need strong technical artists, you need writers, you need game designers. And people should be okay, you know, being a senior game designer and by okay, meaning the company should encourage it. The company should pay handsomely for someone who was willing to stay in that role. Not everyone wants to grow and manage and that's absolutely fine. And as an organization, we need to be okay with that. I think this is, by the way, something that we're talking about a little bit when we talk about succession planning and their kind of own journeys. I think one of the things that we try to do in a, my previous department is really we kind of sat down and we kind of built this really, really pre uh, precise roadmap of What's the difference between a junior artist and an art director? What are the different responsibilities? What are the things that you need to do? What, what will you do different on your day to day? 
And I think it allows people to look at this and say, you know what, I don't want to be an art director. I'm really happy being, you know, uh, a senior artist. So I just maybe I'm happy being kind of a, like a, an assistant art director because that's really what I enjoy and I really want to stay hands on. So as long as you're transparent with the roles, people will be able to kind of find what's right for them. Uh, okay. Mark Beck okay. from Merca. Oh, okay. How would you, um, it's obviously easy to hire a lot of people internally. You talked about like the process to recruit people and the succession plan, but how do you balance internal hiring with outside consultants that can be cheaper and more effective? Um, yeah, no, so that's a great question. I think, you know, like I've used a lot of like third party studios um, and it's really, I think it's really about kind of finding the right skill set for the right task. Um, and I think, like in my in my experience, really, when you kind of kind of outsource your work, first of all, the kind of the overhead management is insane. I mean, almost always, um, and really, you kind of end up paying for it one way or the other. And really, the the, the biggest thing about kind of third parties is really that like you can kind of scale, I guess, quicker. It's not necessarily cheaper. I think once you start really thinking of how much time you're spending on iteration and kind of managing the teams and the processes, I guess it works because you can scale quicker. Um, and I think, yeah, you just want to find the right tasks for, for these people. There's, you know, a whole process of how we, you kind of make it transparent. Like, the one tip I can give you, by the way, um, any studio I've ever worked with, I created a Dropbox, right, between myself and that external studio. And I had a rule saying that uh, everything you do, everything you do needs to live inside that Dropbox. I don't want to get your PSDs or whatever, like, at the end of the pro project. You know, if it's, if it's not in there, I can't see it, then, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. So, like... That's just something that, that we did, and I found that quite useful. Yeah. But see me later, we can talk more about that if you want. Um, if you had any ad advice for teams that have outsourced their art direction. So you've outsourced the, the art direction, but you're doing the art in-house? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it's interesting, because uh, to me, the art direction is really, needs to be really tied into to the game design, right? And like the, like the, the vision of the product. Um, so as long as, I guess, your kind of art director has a really good rapport with like the other, you know, whatever, the CTO or the person who's kind of running the actual game operation, it should be the exact same process, right? But you'd really, you really want to make sure that you have that, that relationship really, really solid, that the art director is really pushing the product somewhere that you really, really believe in. And after that, it's just, honestly, it's just kind of business as usual. Um, but that's quite unusual. Usually you'll try to do the other way around. You'll have the art director sitting, you know, next to the whatever, the lead game designer, and you, know, you can outsource some of the kind of heavy lifting. So there is someone in my company that uh, has some perhaps behavioral problems. <laughs> <laughs> How have you, can you go through a, uh, a what, what's a breakup strategy that you've used before when you've had to face those tough decisions? And, you know, I mean, obviously I want to see the best in him. I want to make sure that he does continue and does uh, stay with the company. Yeah. But how do you, you know, when you see a problem before it becomes a big problem, what do you do? How do you manage that? And then when it comes to the breakup, what do you do? Uh, yeah, Liz, that, I mean, that's, it's, that's always a really, really tricky situation. Um, I think, again, from my experience, ultimately, the first thing you need to do is kind of figure out why there's kind of friction there. I think you'll find a lot of, like, really, really great people that are, um, you know, maybe doing a role that's not kind of not suitable for them. And I think then it's really just, you know, you start with just having a really honest discussion about that. Kind of like, are you happy doing what you're doing? Would you prefer to be doing something else? Sometimes these things can kind of really resolve themselves, right? And, you know, and, so, it's, and sometimes they don't even know, right? Sometimes they, they think they want X and then, you know, after doing it for a while, they realize that, you know, they, they prefer doing Y. And that's okay. And you need to be kind of, I guess, kind of kind enough, right? Or soft enough in the organization that, like, you can move people around without it being kind of uh, tricky to their career. Um, you know, but there are scenarios where, you know, it, it just doesn't work out or someone, you know, is determined that they really want to do something and they're just not particularly good at it. Um, and then I guess it really just depends how kind of, uh, how aware they are of, of where they stand. So, you know, there's a situation where you have to sit down and say, listen, I, I'm really, I'm really sorry, but like, you're not producing what you, what we need you to produce. Um, so, you know, you, either you kind of really, really step it up, and usually that's kind of the first warning, and let's say they haven't, then you say, listen, I, I don't think it's kind of really working out. Um, there's no really, there's nowhere else that we can really kind of see you fit in. Let, we'll try to kind of make sure that you land safely somewhere else. That's, honestly, that's as nice as you can get. I mean, like, there's, there's, if someone's not doing the work, there's, uh, there's nothing else you can do for them, really. But isn't that an artifact of your hiring process? 
If you're hiring personalities over skills and you really value when people can be implementers, you've hired this amazingly great person. They're really good at creating the art, but for the life of them, they can't figure out how to implement because they're just not gonna be technical enough. Yeah. Um, do you have that departing discussion at that point? Yeah, listen, I, I, I like, if you hire right, and I guess, you know, this has just been my philosophy across, across the board, and it's the same thing when I pick people like that I wanna, whatever, play music with or whatever, it's, if I'm, if I'm working with someone and I feel that they genuinely wanna get better, like they genuinely want to improve and they wanna put the time into it, I will give them as much attention as they need, honestly. Like, uh, and I think like when we, as a studio, transitioned from working like in kind of old tech, kind of moving into Unity, Mm -hmm. I'm actually kind of proud like we you know we did not let anyone go like we brought in people we trained them up you know people people for most of it are just hungry to get better at what they do and they want to hone their craft if you hire the right people you know if, if it doesn't work it doesn't work out but I, I must say we, we've just we've had really good success with like investing in the people and kind of training them up and they usually respond to it really well because they can see that you're making an effort you're trying to find them a place in the organization and you know they want to but if they don't, then uh, yeah, it's, uh, you have to kind of part as friends, and that's, uh, that's sad, but it's part of it. Hey, well, thank you very much for your time. I really no appreciate worries. it. Thanks, everybody.